Welcome to the Rapid Fire Radiology Review Series, new from Hot Seat MD. Let's face it, the amount of clinical knowledge that must be mastered by radiologists is overwhelming, and it is easy to lose sight of basic core knowledge and facts when being constantly bombarded with esoterica. To help you focus on the important stuff, Hot Seat MD has designed this Rapid Fire Review Series to break things down to the basic facts. It gives you only what you need to know and retain to get through case conference, the boards, and seeing an unknown while at the view box. And it is fast, designed to cover hours of conference time in 10 minutes or less. Be sure to check out all of the videos, which are also in slideshow format, as well as additional great learning tools at www.hotseatmd.com. All right, let's start with the kidneys. Okay, regarding congenital renal anomalies, the first is renal agenesis. The important association here is genital tract anomalies in females. You can also see ipsilateral adrenal agenesis in 10% of these patients. Horseshoe kidney is the next entity, and it is the most common fusion anomaly. Lower poles of the kidneys are usually attached by either a fibrous or parenchymal band, and the key information here is that horseshoe kidneys have increased susceptibility to trauma, developing stones, and infection. The final entity here is cross-fused renal ectopia, and it may present as an abdominal mass. A key point here is that the renal arteries are usually aberrant, but the ureters insert normally in the urinary bladder. Here's a CT scan showing a horseshoe kidney with a calculus on the right. Now we'll go through the following solid renal masses. Okay, we'll start with renal cell carcinoma. Everyone knows what this is. It uh, comprises a majority of all renal neoplasms. It's more common in men. The age range is about 50 to 70 years and 2% are bilateral. You can see calcifications in a minority of cases, and cystic and multicystic forms are present in roughly 5 to 10% of cases. Growth into the renal vein and IVC are important things to note as they have therapeutic implications, and these metastasize in about 40% and usually goes to lung, local lymph nodes, liver, bone, adrenal glands, and the contralateral kidney. CT findings include a heterogeneously enhancing mass, and if you see soft tissue nodules in the perirenal fat, that is highly predictive of tumor spread. Stranding, on the other hand, in the perirenal fat is nonspecific and is not predictive of tumor spread. Now, venous tumor thrombus, as we mentioned before, can be seen as low-density filling defects in an enlarged vein. MRI and ultrasound both show a heterogeneous mass. I should note that there is a rare variant of renal cell carcinoma which is called renal medullary carcinoma and this is a popular boards type question as it is almost exclusively seen in adolescent and young adults with sickle cell trait or hemoglobin SC disease but not with sickle cell disease in the homozygous form. And here are ultrasound and CT images from the same patient with a renal cell carcinoma involving the right kidney. Next is angiomyolipoma, and these are composed of fat, smooth muscle, and abnormal blood vessels. 80% are solitary and unilateral, whereas the remaining 20% are seen in tuberous sclerosis and can be multicentric and bilateral. These tend to be prone to hemorrhage. Now, regarding imaging, the key is to demonstrate fat in the lesion, and on CT, fat density is diagnostic, although portions of the mass can enhance. Ultrasound, you see a very echogenic solid mass, and MRI demonstrate fat. Angiography shows a hypervascular enlarged feeding artery or arteries and tortuous abnormal vessels with small aneurysms. And here is a prime example of an angiomyolipoma involving the right kidney with some elements of enhancement, but the lesion itself does obviously demonstrate macroscopic fat. 
Let's tackle the other solid renal masses. Renal adenomas are typically less than 3 centimeters, they lack invasive features, and they are indistinguishable from RCC. Octocytomas are rare and large, and they're usually solitary. Larger tumors tend to have stellate central scars, and you see the typical spoke wheel appearance on angiography, but these also are typically indistinguishable from RCC. Lymphoma is usually metastatic, and most are related to Hodgkin's lymphoma. Patterns include diffuse renal enlargement, multiple bilateral solid masses, or a large solid tumor. And on CT, you can see a homogeneous round enhancing mass, and extensive adenopathy, particularly retroperitoneal adenopathy, favors the diagnosis. Metastases are also seen, and most are small, bilateral, irregular, and indistinguishable from RCC. They most commonly occur from lung, breast, colon, and melanoma. The final solid renal mass we'll talk about is xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis, which is an inflammatory lesion which can involve the entire kidney or present as a mass. An obstructing stone or staghorn calculus is usually present, and chronic proteus infection is also usually present. The parenchyma becomes replaced with xanthoma cells in this entity, and CT and ultrasound demonstrate hydronephrosis and a complex mass. Let's talk about cystic renal masses. A simple renal cyst is the most common renal mass, and if they become large enough, they can cause pain, obstruction, hematuria, and hypertension. Complicated renal cysts fall under the Bosniak CT criteria, one through four, with one being a simple cyst, two being a complex but still benign appearing cyst, although if it's greater than three centimeters, they're termed 2F and require follow-up. Group three and four are more concerning lesions and typically involve elements that enhance with contrast. Renal abscesses present as focal renal masses with a thick wall, renal fascial stranding, and they can extend to the perirenal space and cause a fluid collection in this space. Renal cell carcinomas can be cystic or solid, as we've already discussed. And the final lesion is multilocular cystic nephroma, which is a cluster of non-communicating cysts of various sizes and it is bimodal in age distribution and presentation, usually in males less than four years old, and in women between the ages of 40 and 60 years. Here is a simple renal cyst with typical features being present. It is anechoic, it has a very well-defined posterior wall, and it shows increased through transmission of sound and posterior acoustic enhancement. Let's continue with renal cystic diseases that present with multiple bilateral cysts. Autosomal dominant polycystic disease usually are patients with large kidneys with cysts of varying sizes, often with hemorrhage. Most present between the ages of 30 and 50 with hypertension and renal failure. Liver cysts and pancreatic cysts may be present, and the disorder is associated with aneurysms and cardiac anomalies. Multiple simple cysts can obviously be present bilaterally. Von Hippel-Lindau disease can manifest with renal and pancreatic cysts, renal adenomas, and multiple renal carcinomas. This disorder can be associated with retinal angiomas and cerebellar hemangioblastomas. It is autosomal dominant and has incomplete penetrance. Tuberous sclerosis is another autosomal dominant disorder. It can manifest with multiple renal cysts and angiomyolipomas, and can be associated with cutaneous, retinal, and cerebral hamartomas. Acquired cystic kidney disease is next, and is usually seen in chronic hemodialysis patients. They typically have small kidneys, and they can be associated with solid renal adenomas and RCC. Let's continue with medullary cystic disease, including autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. This typically presents in the neonate with enlarged kidneys and sometimes with hepatic involvement. The combination of renal cystic disease and hepatic fibrosis is typical. Ultrasound demonstrates large, centrally echogenic kidneys and hepatosplenomegaly. Medullary sponge kidney is next and involves dysplastic dilatation of the papillary collecting tubules and subsequent stone formation. It is usually asymptomatic, bilateral, and symmetric. Ultrasound demonstrates increased medullary echogenicity. Uremic medullary cystic disease 
presents with renal failure, anemia, and salt wasting. Progressive tubular atrophy and medullary cyst formation is typical, although the cysts are usually too small to be seen with imaging. The kidneys are usually small or normal in size and echogenic. Multicystic renal disease includes multicystic dysplastic kidney, which is diagnosed in utero or at birth, and the typical appearance is small, deformed kidneys with cysts of various sizes. Let's move on to renal infections. Acute pyelonephritis is usually seen in diabetics and involves an ascending UTI with gram-negative bacteria such as E. coli. CT is usually best for seeing this. CT findings can reflect normal kidneys or demonstrate swelling which is diffuse or focal. Hemorrhage can sometimes be present as well. Inflammatory low-density parenchyma molasses can also be seen. Emphysematous pyelonephritis is an acute life-threatening condition with air typically seen in the renal parenchyma. It is usually seen in patients with diabetes mellitus, obstruction, or in immunocompromised patients. Chronic pyelonephritis and reflux nephropathy is next. VU reflux of infected urine is the cause in children, and typically the presentation is blunted calyces, usually the upper calyces, with overlying cortical scarring. Renal tuberculosis may follow pulmonary tuberculosis by greater than 10 years. Usually, there is asymptomatic hematuria or sterile pyuria, and the imaging findings include parenchymal destruction and cavity formation with scarring and parenchymal masses. Regarding renal parenchymal disease, in renal failure, ultrasound is utilized to exclude reversible obstructive uropathy and to confirm parenchymal disease, which appears as increased parenchymal echogenicity. In acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, greater than 50% of patients have increased parenchymal echogenicity. Now, when you see bilateral small kidneys, think systemic disease that injures the kidneys and reduces function. When you see bilateral large kidneys, think systemic diseases that add protein, cells, or fluid. When you see a unilateral small kidney, certain entities such as renal artery stenosis, embolus, thrombosis, trauma, and radiation therapy can cause this appearance. Other causes include post-obstructive or post-inflammatory atrophy, and don't forget congenital hypoplasia as a potential cause. When you see a unilateral large kidney, think renal vein thrombosis and renal artery infarction in the more acute phase, although eventually the kidney becomes small with these entities. Acute obstruction and pyelonephritis can also cause a unilateral large kidney appearance. This brings us to nephrocalcinosis, which relates to pathologic deposition of calcium in the renal parenchyma, and it's usually bilateral. Cortical nephrocalcinosis is rare and is caused by acute cortical nephrosis from ischemia, chronic glomerulonephritis, and primary hyperoxaluria. Medullary nephrocalcinosis is more common and is related to hypercalcemic or hypercalciuric states. It is usually manifest as echogenic renal pyramids on ultrasound. Finally, we come to renal trauma. These include minor injuries, such as contusions, small subcapsular hematomas, traumatic segmental infarctions, and small lacerations, and involve the vast majority of renal injuries. Intermediate injuries involve large subcapsular hematomas, capsular fibrosis leading to hypertension, which is known as a page kidney, and large lacerations, or fractures if they're very large. Major injuries involve renal vascular injury and an entity known as a shattered kidney. Fragments in a shattered kidney do not enhance on CT, and hemorrhage may be life-threatening in this condition. That brings us to the end of the review. I hope it was helpful and most importantly efficient as far as improving your learning of radiology. Good luck and check out www.hotseatmd.com for more great learning opportunities.